All right. Well, let's get going then. There should be outlines in the back if you don't have one. We're in Romans chapter 9, and we're starting in verse uh, verse 19 tonight. It's 9, 19 through 24. We won't finish the chapter tonight. I, I don't want to throw too much at you, uh, even though we'll probably go the full hour. And I want to spend some time dealing with this potter and clay because it's something that shows up in popular Christianity about us being the clay and God molding us to what he wants us to be and that sort of thing. And we need to deal with that because that's not what Paul's teaching, the way contemporary Christianity thinks of it. Uh, in fact, what Paul's dealing with in Romans 9 is God, his purpose for Israel. I never forget that. We're, we're going kind of at a slow pace through Romans chapter 9, dealing with things individually, and it's easy to forget the big picture. And so the first thing on your paper tonight is don't miss the forest for the trees. Okay, don't forget what the context is in Romans chapter 9. We established that in the first week in Romans 9, 1 through 4, where Paul says, I have a sorrow, a heaviness in my heart for my kinsman Israel, to whom were given the promises and the glory and the adoption and all these things that the covenants God gave, gave them. And the question is, what happened to them? Because Paul is explaining how everybody gets this, this, this access freely by God's grace in the first eight chapters. And now what happened to God's purpose for Israel? So we dealt the last couple weeks about how God, uh, God is teaching that it's not all of Israel is going to receive those promises. It's not all of Israel is going to get those. Something happened to Israel. Uh, something happened when they were offered God's provision. They rejected it. And Paul is showing how God has every right to reject them, what he promised the nation, if they don't get into his provision. Okay? And so it's not something where just because the generation 2,000 years ago killed Jesus Christ, their Messiah, means all of a sudden God throws his whole purpose for Israel in the trash can. That's not the case. Okay? In fact, we're learning that God uh, works all throughout history through the believing <coughs> portion of Israel. Right? So it wasn't everyone in Abraham's family, it was just Isaac. It wasn't everyone in Isaac's family, it was just Jacob. It's not everyone in the nation of Israel, it's just those that believe. Right? So if the whole generation 1,000 years ago, or the majority at least, did not believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they don't get it, okay? But there's a remnant that does. Don't miss the forest for the trees when we study through these things. A lot of the church gets confused about Romans 9 through 11 because of the misconception, which hopefully you're guarded against, understanding the Bible rightly divided, that the church replaced Israel and assumed their position in the covenants and in the promises and everything else. And so they, they, they come to Romans 9 with that thinking. They come to Romans 9 with that understanding, and they read everything in Romans 9 as being about the church, as being Israel didn't get it, but the church did, as if those are the only two <coughs> entities in your Bible. Okay? They come to the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and think what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the church is replacing Israel. Before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God dealt with Israel exclusively. When Jesus came, they think he came starting a new thing. And he didn't. He came to fulfill the things that was promised to Israel. Romans 1580 came to be a minister of the circumcision, but they think that's when the church began. Okay? And so this, this is crucial to our understanding of Romans 9 through 11, because as Paul writes Romans uh, 9 through 11, he's describing the events back here. What happened to Israel? Okay? We see these events over the course of, you know, four or five years here. What happened to Israel? What happened? That's what Paul's describing. If you think this time period describes the church, Romans 9 through 11 is the church, and you're the branches grafted in and everything else. Okay? If, as some people think, the church didn't start when Jesus was born, but instead started at Pentecost, that's the green line here, and Paul's talking about this again. What happened to Israel? The church replaced them. Right? But what happens when you understand that there's Israel in the Old Testament, and Jesus came to call out the remnant, the leaving remnant of Israel? And the mystery of the church, the new creature, wasn't given until Paul much later. What happened to Israel? The answer would be, God called out the remnant. He gave the king, took the kingdom away from the whole nation and gave it to that one remnant of the nation bearing the fruits. Right. So we talk about being mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalist, and we're seeing in Romans 9, it matters. Okay, Where you, in the book of Acts, place yourself being the church, the body of Christ. If you think the church you're in started with Jesus' birth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's no hope for you not being Israel. Okay? If you think the church started at Pentecost, there's no hope for you not being Israel. Romans 9 through 11 must talk about you. But if the church began with the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ given to Paul, then there was something that happened to Israel, and it wasn't you. 
Okay, something happened to Israel, and it was Jesus calling out 12 disciples who weren't the priests and kings, calling out a group of followers that were not the majority. Okay, the remnant. And we'll learn more about that tonight and next week. But just wanted to review a little bit about that here at the beginning. That Romans 9 through 11 is a minefield for a lot of people because of the, presum- the presumptions, the, 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 the presuppositions they come to the text with about when the church began. Okay? So, understanding the mystery of Christ, understanding Paul's special apostleship will affect the way we, we, we see some of these things. Uh, we're also very carefully going through Romans chapter 9, issue by issue. And uh, I need to, to remind you to read the passage in its entirety, okay, when you get the chance. And we try to do that as I teach. But I have to deal with some of these particular issues because they're made into problems for people doctrinally about their salvation and whatnot. And so last week we dealt some with uh, some Calvinist readings of some of these passages. We'll deal with it again tonight. We'll take the one verse and we'll have to deal with some problems in it. These are rocks in the soil, right? Can't plant the seed until you get the rocks out. So here I'm digging, saying that's not right, and this is not right. So you can look at the dirt and say, what's here? What's really here? Okay, and that's what we need to do. And so some, some of our study through Romans 9 through 11 will be just that, just pointing out the wrong interpretation so that we can see it without the bias, without the prejudice. So when we read it through the context, knowing that Paul's theme is what happened to Israel, what's God's purpose for Israel, everything he says has to do with that. He's not here explaining the beginning of the church. He's not here explaining who are you in Christ. We dealt with that in Romans 6 and 7. Okay, he's dealing here with what happened with God's purpose for Israel. Okay, and so with that, let's start in Romans 9, 19. We left off last week dealing with the issue of God hardening and giving mercy to people and how that was not some eternal decree before the world began, but was rather the way God responded to people when they resisted him. When they rejected him, God has two choices. He can give mercy, or he can deal with a strong hand, which was his right, if they resist him, right? And so we, we saw that back in Exodus when Israel was worshiping the golden calf. God wanted to give a strong hand in response, and Moses said, don't do it, Lord, for my sake. So God dealt mercifully with Israel, did not kill them before they even went to the wilderness. But with Pharaoh, it's a little different. He went to Pharaoh and, and, and marched Moses right up to him and said, the God of my people said, let us go, right? Didn't even ask nicely. He just said, do it, right? And so God dealt with Pharaoh very hard. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And God, has, again, has that prerogative to deal with you with mercy, to deal with you with hardness. That's his choice, okay? And that's what Paul was showing in Romans 9, uh, 14 through 18 there, that it's God's choice. It's of his will, not of your will. It's not even what you do, okay? <coughs> you can resist him a little bit, resist him a lot, God has the, the, the choice to respond to you in such a way or not, okay? But it has nothing to do with God choosing who's going to be saved from before the world began. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Verse 19 then says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And so here is uh, someone responding rhetorically or, or uh, uh, to, to Paul, okay, in what he's teaching here, that God will do what he wants, uh, in response to you. And the question is, why doth he yet find fault? If it's true that God will deal with mercy to whom he wants and deal with the hardness to whom he wants, then why does he find fault in anybody? Because if you would have dealt with me in mercy instead of hardness, maybe I wouldn't have responded that way. Right? And so this is the idea. This is the response. If you're a parent, you recognize this response. If you're a parent, you recognize this being the response of a self-justifying child. Okay? Dad, if you just dealt with me a little differently, maybe I wouldn't have done that. You know, if she wouldn't have yelled at me, I wouldn't have pulled her hair or whatever it is. That doesn't mean it's right. You see, this is the question here. He dealt with me hard. I responded harder back to him. I resisted him more. He hardened my heart. But if you would have dealt with me in mercy like you did those Israelites, we wouldn't have done that. No, you would have done it as a sinner anyway. Okay, you see? Your sin is the problem, not the way God responds to you. And so this is, this is the same thing that was going on back in Romans 3, if you recall, Romans 3, verse 3, where Paul was explaining how not only the Gentile nations, but the Jews were without excuse because they were given the law, and they had every reason, the oracles of God, to do what God said, and yet they even disobeyed, okay? In Romans 3, verse 3, uh, Paul asked, What if some did not believe? What if some of Israel, some of the Jews, did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? The answer, of course, is no. Just because some didn't believe doesn't mean God's purpose for Israel is thrown out the door. 
Okay, God will do what he says. God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar. And in some cases in history, that was the case. Okay, as it is written that thou mightest be justified. Who might be justified? God might be justified. Not the person, the, the human, the man that he's dealing with, that God might be justified in, in his sayings. Verse 5. So here's again the response from Israel here trying to question Paul. If our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? So you see what he's saying here. He says, if our being sinners commends God being true and proving that he's true and, and, and we're liars, and he gets some benefit from us being evil because now his glory shines even further, then why does he seek vengeance out on us? Right? Why does he condemn us? Doesn't he need sinners? Doesn't God need sinners to prove that he's righteous? Answer, no, he doesn't. The fact that he punishes sinners is only indicative that you're a sinner. Not that God is right. God is right whether you're there or not. You see, that's the point. But these people are trying to self-justify themselves. They're saying, I, God needs me. He doesn't. You see, that's what Romans 3, 4 is teaching, 4, 5 it teaches. So he says in verse 5 there in parentheses, I speak as a man, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? On what basis does God judge the world if he needs sinners to be who he is? So there's that contrast, like we need black to be white, we need good, or the evil to be good. That's not the case, okay? And, and so in Romans chapter 9, verse 19, why doth he yet find fault? Why does he yet give vengeance? Why does he judge, right? That's what they're asking here. For who hath resisted his will. Um, and so, why does he find fault? If Romans 9.11 is true, Romans 9.11 says that uh, the purpose of God according to election, that's his choice, might stand, not of works, the works of man, but of God that calls. God's purpose is performed by his choice, his doing, not of the doing of man. Right? Romans 9, verse 16. It is of God that wills, not of man that runs, or uh, but of God that, or excuse me, I read that wrong. It is not of him, of man that wills, nor of man that runs, but of God that shows mercy. You see, so again, the, the point proven that it's God is the one that gives mercy. It's his purpose that's getting done. It's not that you come to God and ask, what is your purpose for me? We should be asking God, what is your purpose? Period. Right? And we're going to get into that. Okay? And so Romans 9, 16, it's, it's God's mercy here. And in Romans 9, verse 18, he asks then, why does he yet find fault? Well, he finds fault because uh, you're a sinner, okay? God doesn't owe us anything. It's our response to him that matters for eternity. It's not his response to us. We can't stand at the judgment seat of God and say, well, God, you know, I would have been better, but the first time I sinned, you slapped me down, right? Well, whose fault was that? You that sinned, <laughs> not God that slapped you down. Why didn't you show me mercy, a second chance? He doesn't owe you a second chance. Okay. Why didn't he give Israel a third chance? You know, some pastors teach that God always gives a second chance. Well, you find a lot of examples of that in the Bible. Why doesn't he give them a third chance, or a fourth chance, or a fifth chance? He doesn't owe us anything. One sin is all it takes, you see. It's of God's mercy that we're still around, right? So he doesn't owe us anything. It's our response to him that's the point. That's why he finds fault. It's not his response to us. We can't look at God and say, you're at fault, God, because you responded to me differently than you did to him. That's his prerogative, okay? He doesn't have to respond to us all the same way. Now, a holy, righteous God will judge us all by the same standard. That's different than how he responds to us in mercy or with a hard hand, okay? Which is what Paul's dealing with here. And so hardening is what, happen, is what happens when people resist God's will. The question is asked by this self-justifying blasphemer. I say blasphemer because they're standing before God questioning the way he does things. <laughs> well, who are you to question God? Right, which is what Paul says later. But he, they ask, who hath resisted his will? Now the Calvinists take this verse and they make it to mean that this person who's trying to self-justify themselves is actually teaching right doctrine. That nobody could resist God's will. It's irresistible. What God decreed before the world began is going to have him predetermined whether, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. Now we've already seen that God's purpose is going to be done. There's nothing you can do to change his purpose. Nothing you can do to change what he's going to accomplish. And yet it says, who has resisted his will? The answer is, a lot of people in the Bible have. The answer is, this person, who is not in God's purpose, has resisted his will. The answer is, Pharaoh resisted his will. When Moses came and said, let my people go, did Pharaoh say, okay. No, he resisted God's will. 
Okay. Now, of course, you may say that's what God intended, right? Well, God dealt with my hard heart, and that's what happened. But His will is never to, to make sinners sin. This is the, the problem with Calvinism. Okay. The problem is that they say that God made them sin. God's will is that some people sin. God's will for other people is that they don't sin. No. God's will for everyone is that they do right, that they live, they by faith do what God says. That's God's will for everybody. Okay? The people who don't, that's the reason why he finds fault in them. Right? It's not because he decreed that they would sin no matter what. All right? Adam sinned, and that was his fault, not God's. And so, who has resisted his will is the question here. By the way, the just, uh, the just live by their faith no matter what God does to them. You know, in, in Job 13, verse 15, uh, Job says that though he slay, though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. Okay, Job, of course, had lost everything in, his, in the book back there, in his life, his family, his, his, his riches, his health, right? And his friends are trying to get him to admit his own sin, which isn't the issue tonight. But Job is saying, you know what? God can kill me, and I'm still going to trust him. Okay, his wife said to curse God and die, right? That's what Job couldn't do, right? The man of faith, the just man, lives by his faith in God. That's it. No matter how God responds to him, he's responding to God in faith. He's got to. God is. God is true. God is holy. God is right, okay, in what he does. So Job 13, verse 15. He turned out, by the way, Job in, in, in his life back there turned out to be on the right side of the equation, having faith in God, even though even in himself he uh, was a little self-righteous. In Job 40, verse 1, God answers Job and says, Shall he that contends with the Almighty instruct him? So here's someone in Romans 9 saying, Why does God find fault? Who's resisted his will? And God says to Job, the earliest book in the Bible, Who's going to contend with the Almighty God and actually instruct him of something that he doesn't know? Right? He that reproves God, let him answer it. Job answers the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. I'll shut up, Lord. Say nothing else. Right? So that's the response of the man of faith right there. Okay? In Romans 9, this person, this, retort, this, this imaginary person here, is responding with resistance all the way. Well, God can't do that. God can't judge me. God owes me something. I'm of Abraham. I'm in Israel. Right? Okay. What happened to Israel? What happened to them? Well, why did God do it? Paul's saying he has the prerogative to do what he wants with Israel. Okay? So who hath resisted his will? The will here, by the way, is God's response. That's what we've been talking about. He'll have mercy on whom he wants. He'll harden whom he wants. It's God's response to sinful humanity. That's what it is. His will here is not a salvation decree. You don't find that anywhere in the passage. All right? The same generation, the same nation that he gave mercy to and delivered them out of Egypt died in the wilderness because of their sin. So which were they? Vessels of mercy or vessels of wrath? Answer, both at different times. Right? And so this is not an eternal salvation decree. God's decreed you'll be saved. There's no getting out of it. The will here is his will to respond in mercy or his will to respond with a hard hand, right? And who can resist that? Nobody. He's going to do what he does. You can't tell him to do otherwise, right? That's what's going on here. And so when it says that who has resisted his will, I've listed on your outline there five or six different uh, places in your Bible, and you can find many more, where God's will is resisted. The philosophical machinations of Calvinists and their debates really have a heyday with this. Can anybody really resist God's will? What is free will? What is your will? It's not that complicated, folks. Okay, God has a purpose. You make choices. Lots of times you make choices contrary to what God would have you do. Does that ruin God's purposes? No, it doesn't. Right? Because you're not that important. You know, people have this idea that you know, if man has the ability to choose something, he's going to mess up God's plan. As if we can. Right? We're puny humans. He's God. So that's the, the missing element here. And so in, in uh, Ezekiel 33, verse 11, for example, uh, God appeals to Israel that they would turn from their evil ways. Right? And uh, we see here that they don't. I'll cover just a few of these. There are times in the Bible where God says to do this, and you know what? Man has the, the gall not to do it. It's a... God has to respond to that. And he's got a choice to respond in mercy or with a hard hand in judgment. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. 
Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Which should tell you that God did not decree from eternity past that his glory would come from judging these sinners. Right? Which is what Calvinists must teach. Because he decrees everything. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And yet a lot of wicked people have died. Right? And face God in judgment and don't get righteousness. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Now, if it's true that God had decreed that person would be wicked and there's nothing else he can be, then why does God ask him to turn from his wicked ways? How can he possibly? Right? Because he can. He can turn from his wicked ways. What prevents him from doing so? His own will. The, himself. The person. They don't want to turn from their wicked ways. Okay? So here it says, God says, He that, that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? You, you, you can hear the, the burden of the Lord here. He's saying, here's what's right. Here's the purpose. I've, I've given you the promise. I've given you what you need. Why will you die? You know how I'm going to respond if you keep sinning. Why do you do that? And they do it. Right? <coughs> And, and here's the wicked Israel responding in Romans 9 saying, who resists God's will? He won't change his mind. There's no negotiation with him. Of course not. Right? God has a purpose. He's God. You're the ones that are supposed to be in it. <coughs> and yet they don't turn from their evil ways. You'll see in the Old Testament, they, they, they get the, the judgment that the law declared unto them because they did not choose life. They chose death. Right? And it's the same with, with, with others as well. Look at uh, Rome, uh, Luke 13, 34. This is one of those passages that, again, causes covenant theologians problems because they read this and they think this is where God gave up Israel for good. He got tired of dealing with them. They must not realize that God had dealt with them a hundred times before in a similar manner. Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth her brood, or doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. What did he say there? Let's read that again. How often would I have gathered thy children together? Why didn't you, Lord? If nothing can, is, is too, you know, resisting your will, why didn't you just do it? Force them to. He said, ye would not. What kept Jesus from bringing in the kingdom in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was that Israel rejected him. Right? Now, God used that for his purpose when he died on the cross. And that brought salvation to all men. See, that's how wise God is and how dumb we are. But you see here, it has to do with you would not. He will not fulfill his purpose who would not do his will. That's what it means. He will not give blessings and his promise and his, and his, to people who do not have faith in him. You see, that's the condition. 35, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He said, you won't see me. The kingdom won't come until you respond positively to me. And by the way, he's not speaking here about individual people, but about the nation in whole, as a whole, Jerusalem, the city, right? So these people in Jerusalem are going to die. But there'll be a time when Jerusalem, the people in it, will respond positively to Jesus. That's when the kingdom comes. Not then, right? So again, we see people resisting Jesus' will. Romans 13, verse 2. Uh, don't want to get too much into this topic. We'll get to it verse by verse later. Romans 13, verse 2. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God. <gasps> That's impossible. Who resists his will? Apparently, someone who resists the powers that are ordained of God is resisting here the ordinance of God. Okay. So again, we'll deal with what that means in the future. I know that deals with our governments and all that, and you all have questions about it, but... Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here, there are people who blatantly resist God's will, and, and, and by the way, they get judgment for that, right? That, that's them sinning against God. 1 Timothy 2, 4, God's will to see all men saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Does that happen? Those who think that God's will always gets accomplished make it universalism. Well, if God's will to see all men saved, all men must be saved. That, that's what must follow. That hasn't, what, that hasn't been what has happened, okay? Not everyone has been saved in the past. Even if everyone from now on forward gets saved, not everyone in the past has been. You see? So God had a will, had a purpose, and not everyone got into it. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18. You see here again where there are people resisting Paul. It says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. Paul, 
by the Holy Spirit, says, I'm, I want to come to Thessalonians. I want to go there and minister to these people. But Satan hindered us. And people don't believe in Satan anymore. The word Satan means adversary, opposition. Who hath resisted God's will? I'll give you one person who resisted his will. Satan and all his children, which would be all you sinners, right? They resisted. Now, are they going to win? No. Are they more powerful than God? No. But have they resisted? Yeah. Okay, there's a lot of resistance, right? And it wasn't God's purpose for you to resist. So Calvinists make Romans 9.19 an issue that isn't there. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 8 says, Now as Jan Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You can identify people by their resistance to God's truth. But that just shows you that we live in a present evil world of people who resist God's truth. Okay, Romans 9.19 says, Who has resisted his will? The answer to this self-justifying person is, You are resisting his will. Otherwise, why don't you accept the fact that he only gives his promises to the remnant of Israel that believe in the Messiah? Why don't you accept that fact instead of saying, Because I'm circumcised, I must get the promises. Right? And so you see why Paul's explaining, a, explaining this in Romans chapter 9 here. Why does he find fault? Because you sin. Who resists his will? You do, O man. Romans 9, verse 20. Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? So it's not just talking about who resists God's will and who does it. But why are you even in the same room debating with God at the same table? Because you're not God. He is. Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? So again, we've got this, this idea uh, that, that God has made all things the way that they are, which is the Calvinist idea of, of election before the world began, right, of all things. And uh, it says here that God has, who hath, why hast thou made me thus? And people read that and they say, well, apparently God has made you just the way he wants you, right? And, and God's still working on you a little bit, you know, as the song goes, right? He's still working on me. But he's made you exactly where he wants you, right? Actually, the, the Calvinist idea is if God has made everything the way that he, his will is designed to be, then we're exactly where he wants us. Okay? The president's exactly who he wants. This country's exactly where it needs to be. Right? I don't believe that. You see? And yet that's what that idea that God has elected everything to happen as they should happen before the world began, that's what it teaches. Right? That's a wrong thing. Okay? There are people who resist God in history, and then there's people who don't resist God throughout history, and God does his purpose through those who don't resist him. You see? The believers, the faithful, those are his people. And that's what Paul's trying to show about Israel here. It's not all of Israel, it's those that followed him that are the true children of Israel. All right, so that's what's going on here. Shall the, form th uh, the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Answer, no, he should not say that at all. So without even getting into what does it mean that thou hast made me thus, shall the thing formed say, say anything to him that formed it? No, you don't have the right to say anything. He's the creator. The idea of the picture of God forming something and you being the thing that formed, right, means that you're not on the same level with him, <laughs> okay? Again, parents, you realize this. You made your children, right? They talk back to you and you say, I'm the parent. I made you. Where do you think you came from? Okay, now your neighbor, you can't say that to them, <laughs> okay? They're speaking to you, hey, you know, get off my property. But your children are going, get out of my room. And you're going, this is my house. You see, the difference here, God made things, so the thing formed, can't say the thing that made it. Why? You know, why are you doing this? So, so we have this idea of, uh, well, some people say God's sovereignty. The word sovereignty isn't in the Bible, but the biblical concept is the idea that God <laughs> is over all. Right? God is the creator of all things. He has power over all things. So who are we who are under all things to say to him, you know, why he should do the things that he does? Okay. And so that's what's going on here. D what's happening is disobedient Israel uh, is being identified as ungrateful children. All right. Again, uh, the, the idea in verse 20, when the thing formed responds to God, why hast thou made me thus? Right. That's, that's, you, you find ungrateful children doing that. Right. Why did you give me the small piece of pizza and my sister the biggest one? You know, why didn't you give me the same amount of money as you know, my sister? Ungrateful child, you know. I give you things because I didn't give you the same as that person. You're responding to me. Why? Right? It's my things to give. That's what God's saying here. It's not for you, ungrateful child. Okay? So that's what's happening here. We have Israel who were declared to be the children of God in time past. Right? The nation. But we're learning here not all the nation is the faithful, the grateful. 
right? And so, look at Isaiah 29. We're going to go through some of the Old Testament tonight, because we need to get some context here to why Paul is explaining this about Israel. And we see that this isn't new to Paul. Paul's not creating this out of thin air. Uh, this is stuff that the prophets had dealt with before, and that the unfaithful Israel is just too blind to see it. Isaiah 29, start down in verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. He says they speak things like they, they, they know me. They, they, they're near me with their mouth, but they don't fear me. They have no faith in me. They don't love me. He sees the thoughts and intents of their heart. Therefore, verse 14, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work amongst this people. A marvelous work, by the way, of judgment. Is what he's going to describe. A marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. What happens when Jesus comes in his earthly ministry? Okay, there are some that hear him and believe him and love him, and some that reject him, and to Israel that rejects him, he speaks to them in parables. He says, you know what I'm going to do? To you ungrateful children who don't receive me, I'm going to hide wisdom from you and hide understanding from you. That's your punishment, you see. But to those that received him, he gave the power to become sons of God. John 1, John 1 verse 12. Okay. Isaiah 29 verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? As if they can hide something from God. As if they can say on the same level as God, I've got my own counsel, and God has his counsel. Or, you know. Verse 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Oh, potter's clay. We're going to get that in Romans 9 here in a moment, right? Well, why is it the potter's clay? What's being turned upside down? Well, there's God and there's people, and they put themselves up at the top as if God should be listening to them, right? That's if you turn it all upside down. Because of that, you'll be like potter's clay. I'm the potter, you're the clay, smash, right? That's what happens, okay? You get the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say to him that framed it, he had no understanding? That's exactly what Paul says in Romans 9.20. He's quoting Old Testament, folks. You can't just say, oh, Paul is teaching Calvinism here. Paul is teaching some new doctrine. No, he's quoting Isaiah 29, when rebellious, disobedient Israel put themselves in God's place, and he says, your heart's not near me, and I'm going to hide wisdom from you, and I'm going to crush you like the potter's clay. And who are you to tell me that I have no understanding? Okay. And so Isaiah 29 is, is a division, a splitting of obedient Israel and disobedient Israel. And we're seeing the same thing in Romans 9. Paul's explaining the difference between believing and unbelieving Israel. Matthew 15, 7 through 9, Jesus says the same thing as Isaiah. And so uh, everything in Jesus' earthly ministry was a fulfillment of those prophets back there. And you see uh, Paul just explaining what was happening. Paul was explaining what's happening here. You see what Paul's doing in Romans 9 through 11? He's explaining what happened to Israel. Because when Jesus came, he came preaching the kingdom, but it didn't come. So what happened? Matthew uh, chapter 15, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, uh, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We just read that, Isaiah 29. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Huh. So apparently, Jesus had the same idea that Paul was explaining that he had. <laughs> Paul's explaining what happened here, right? That he came to Israel, and some in Israel didn't have ears to hear. Right? So what do they get? Do they get the kingdom? No, they don't. They get what he gave to Pharaoh, which is destruction. Right? They, they get what the, what the first nation in the wilderness got with Israel, which is they died in the wilderness. <coughs> right? And so they don't get the promises. Remember the question, what's happening to Israel? Who gets the promises? Well, not those people. Okay, That's what Paul's explaining here. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 30. Learn a lot from these prophets about Jesus' earthly ministry. And since Paul's talking about his earthly ministry, we're learning a lot about what Paul says in Romans 9 through 11. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1 through 3. And this is right after we just read about the disobedient Israel there. Woe to the rebellious children. We've seen twice in Romans 9 already statements made by rebellious children, right? We've been talking about disobedient Israel, which were called the children of God. Isaiah 30 says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. 
So they're taking counsel of anybody, of themselves, of any other person, but not me. Why don't they take God's counsel? That cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, they walk, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, to trust to the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul's talking about Pharaoh in Romans 9, and Isaiah 30 is talking about those same rebellious children, that they're going to get the punishment of Pharaoh. Isn't that what it said there? Since you went down to Egypt and not to me to get counsel, since you followed after their sins, you'll get the same thing Pharaoh got. Destruction. Right? Even though you're Israel. Even though you came from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you're still going to get destruction because you didn't respond to me faithfully. You see? So you, you see what, what, what's being taught here. So because they didn't uh, get into God's purpose, they don't get the promises. They don't get the kingdom. Okay? Let, let's look at Isaiah chapter 30, verses 10 through... Well, I don't want to read all those. Chapter 30, verse 10 through 18 here is what I have on the outline. Which say to the seers... Uh, verse 9 is what I want. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Jesus came, and he came communicating the law. John the Baptist came teaching the law, and they did not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not to us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. So Isaiah is saying here that what happened with Israel, they didn't want the law. They wanted people to tell them lies. They wanted people not to prophesy true things, prophesy false things. Right? Jesus came. How did they receive him? They didn't. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. Okay? In verse 11, Get ye out of the way, turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. What? Now, I just made an application of Jesus' earthly ministry, and by divine decree, the next verse talks about Jesus' earthly ministry. It's in the Bible there. I don't think myself higher than that. But the Holy One is Jesus, isn't it? Isn't that the Messiah, the anointed one? And Isaiah's prophesying about rebellious people who don't want to hear the truth, don't want to hear the law. They don't want the Holy One to be amongst them. They want him to cease from before us. So the Holy One comes to Israel. They don't receive him. He came to his own. His own received him not. And they wanted the Holy One to cease. Who was screaming that they crucified? Rebellious Israel. Do they get the promises? No. Nope. Well, who gets them? Right? What happened to Israel? What's going to be the answer? The remnant, right? It's always been the case. This is prophesied material, folks. This is not about the church, the mystery. It's not about a new creature in heaven. This has always been the case. There's been a rebellious Israel that wanted to kill God, get rid of his prophets, kill the Holy One, right? And don't get the kingdom, okay? In, in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose break comes suddenly at an instant. It'll be like a flood, is what he said. It'll wipe you out. He shall break it as the breaking of potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. Whoa! There's another potter's vessel. People read Paul in Romans 9 and say, oh, we're the clay in God's hands. He's forming us, you know. Do you know the prophecies about the potter's vessels? There's lots of them. And they always talk about Israel. And they always talk about rebellious Israel and how God's going to smash them. Because they don't get into his will. So he says, it's like the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the, the bursting of it a shard to take fire from the earth. Or to take water with all of the pit. Crushed obliterated, right? Where'd that vessel come from? Who was the potter? Who was the vessel? The potter's God. The vessel's Israel. And they were disobedient. And so they get his wrath. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, by the way, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. Who resisted his will? These people, <laughs> Right? The, the blasphemer in Romans 9. Who's resisted God's will? The answer, you are. Why don't you return in quietness and in rest, believe on the Messiah? But they didn't. But ye said, verse 16, no, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they pursue you to the swift. They ran from God, is what he's saying. So verse 17 and 18 talks about the uh, punishment that's going to come upon them as a result. Um, Verse 18, therefore will the Lord wait. The Lord wait. What is he waiting for? 
He's waiting for his people. He's waiting for them to do right. He's waiting for them to get into his purpose as he promised it would happen. So it's not going to happen then. The kingdom's not coming in Isaiah 30. The kingdom's not coming in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's going to wait. All right, in verse 18, that the Lord will wait and he may be, that he may be gracious unto you. Unto who? The vessel he just smashed? Or unto Israel that he has promised to? Right? He be gracious unto you. Therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Huh. There's God's mercy again. He has mercy on those that respond faithfully to him. According to Isaiah chapter 30. So in Jesus' earthly ministry, those who rejected him, who wanted to kill him, he's going to smash them. They're not going to get the kingdom. Okay? Let's move on here. Look at Isaiah 64. Since you're in the vicinity here. Isn't this fascinating? Studying Israel's history and prophecy and getting some understanding about what Paul means when he quotes prophecy. People see Paul quoting prophecy and they automatically make the church Israel. And that's not so. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. Who's the we? Who's the our of Isaiah 64? Israel. We'll find it here in the next verse. We are the clay, and thou art potter. We all are the work of thine hand. We all are the work. It's not that we each individually are a, a unique work of God that he's forming each of us personally to a perfect plan. No, there's God has a purpose for the earth that through Israel all the nations will be blessed. And Israel says, we are the work of your hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee. By the way, who are, who are these people talking? Does this sound like rebellious people to you? Mm -hmm. These are the faithful people. These people are going, where's your kingdom, Lord? You promised us something. Where's that at? How long? You know, will you remember iniquity forever? Verse 10. The holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem is a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burnt up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Who's the, who's the afflicted here? Faithful Israel. Right? Not rebellious Israel. There's two Israels. There's faithful Israel and unfaithful Israel. There's disobedient Israel and obedient Israel. Let's look at Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Isaiah 64, Isaiah 30, Isaiah 29 all said that God's the potter and Israel's the clay. Let's, let's see it again. And, uh, well, we're going to go to Jeremiah 18 here in a moment. I'm going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and Jeremiah 29. Let me get these in your hands here. You, you may know these verses from your uh, memorization before. But in Romans chapter 9, verse 21, Paul says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel into honor and another into dishonor? So you bring up this issue of the potter and the clay. We've seen the potter and clay reference to Israel three times in, in the past. You'll read this verse, and they make themselves the lump of clay. They make God the potter of their person, their lives individually, you know, their career, whom they're going to marry, the choice they're going to make for dinner tonight. And God is shaping their life in such a way of a secret, imaginative plan that is not revealed yet to you. And that's how it's going to work. They, they, they take that from a spiritual application of Jeremiah 1.5 and Jeremiah 29.11. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And so you see this on bookmarks and banners. God knew you before, while you're being formed in the womb. He ordained you a prophet of the nations. And they say it with a straight face because they don't become a prophet of the nations. They do something else, right, with their life. And yet here, Jeremiah 1 5, is God ordaining a person. You see the words thee? I knew thee, I sanctified thee before thou camest forth. Mm -hmm. That's singular. He's talking to one person. Who is the person he's talking to here? Jeremiah, right? He ordained Jeremiah, a prophet of the nations. Not all of you. And yet people read this, apply it to themselves. God knew me in the womb, and he formed me, and he sanctified me, and separated me, a prophet of the nations. Only they replaced prophet of the nations with, you know, American Idol singer, you know, in America. Or, right? Whatever it is that they think God's formed them to be, right? They never find a verse proclaiming what God formed them to be, which would be a lot better. I'd be much happier if you quoted this verse and then actually found God's will in the Bible and said, God wants me to be in Christ. He wants me to be thankful in all things. Fine. 
quote the spiritualization of the verse. But people don't do that. They remain ignorant of God's will. They quote Jeremiah 1.5 out of context. God ordained Jeremiah to do what? His purpose to prophesy to Israel about God's purpose, about the kingdom, about who they are, about where they're going to go. Right? Not everyone was Jeremiah. Not everyone was Paul. Okay? There's only certain people God ordained. There's one time where God takes a pagan king, Cyrus, and calls him his anointed. That doesn't mean every pagan king was God's anointed. Okay? He chose that one. Uh, meanwhile, look at Jeremiah 29.11. This is another place where people take it entirely out of context. Paul says, you're the potter, and he has the clay there, and so people want to think that God, we're in God's hands, that his hands are around us, and he's hugging us tight, and where you see only one footprint in the sand, that's because God's carrying us and kissing us on the forehead and everything else. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. It doesn't have the same ring as the NIV. If you have an NIV, you read this, and it, man, God has a plan for you, right? Here it just says he has thoughts towards you, and his thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end, which isn't really as exciting as some of the other translations. But nonetheless, it's not even talking about you. It's talking about the nation of Israel. Read the chapter. He's talking about the nation being taken captive. He says, in 70 years, I'll bring you back. And that's when he says in verse 11, for I know the thoughts I have to think towards you, the nation, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace. I'm not going to destroy this nation. I'm not going to take you out to Babylon to have you die there and wither in the wilderness. He says, I have an expected end for you. What's God's expected end for Israel? That they would be a nation above the nations, that the world would be blessed through them, right? So he can't kick them out of the land forever. He's got to bring them back sometime. He has an expected end. He has a known end for them, right? Every end that people make this to be about their personal lives, they can't find a verse in the Bible about it. God, show me the end of your purpose for me. What is your plan? And God never responds because they're not reading the Bible and knowing what God would have them do in this dispensation. Okay, which is to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Ephesians 3 9. So Jeremiah 29 11. Again, these two verses are what people take out of context and apply to themselves because they think that every promise in the book is theirs. They think that every promise to Israel is theirs. What's Paul's purpose in Romans 9? What happened to Israel's promises? How does everyone answer it? God gave them to us. You know, he didn't, right? We're learning that it's the remnant of Israel. It's the people that Jesus ordained to have it. When he said, I give you, little flock, the kingdom. When he says, I'm taking it away from all of Israel, giving it to faithful Israel. Not the church. He didn't form the church until later. Right? He didn't explain the mystery of what happened on the cross until later. So you're in Jeremiah. Turn to chapter 18. I just took a little parenthet uh, parenthetic stop there in Jeremiah 1 and Jeremiah 29 to give us how most people think of the potter and the clay, even though we've seen three times already that the potter and clay have to do with God and Israel's relationship, their covenant. Jeremiah 18 is the prophecy of the potter and the clay, so a good reference for Romans 9 would be Jeremiah 18. Okay, The word which came to Jeremiah, the ordained prophet of the Lord, by the way, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. So we should all go to T.D. Jake's church, you know, at the potter's house, what he calls his church, right? That's not what he's saying. That's where he gets the name of his church. You know, Pastor T.D. Jakes, he, he makes circles every now and then. Yeah. He calls his church the potter's house. He gets from Jeremiah 18. We're not the potter's house. Potter. He thinks he's Israel. Why? When does he think the church began? Right here. He thinks it's right here. So he thinks the answer to why happened to Israel is God gave it all to us. Right? He thinks the church began at Pentecost. Okay, so you have the potter's house here. And by the way, this is a literal potter's house. He told Jeremiah to go there. He didn't tell you to go there. You're looking for God's will for your life. You turn it open to Jeremiah 18. You say, apparently God wants me to go to a potter's house. What? No. He told that to Jeremiah. Who is speaking? God. To whom is he speaking? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Not you. Right? It's not that hard. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house. He did God's will. He didn't resist it. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. He's making something out of clay. The vessel that he made the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. That seemed good to the potter to make it. There's a potter. He's got a lump of clay. He's working it. All of a sudden, it's, it's wrong. It's just not right. It's marred. Right? What's he do? Makes another one. Out of the same lump, even. 
has seemed good to the potter's maker. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? So who's the clay? Israel. It's Bible study is not that difficult. It requires you open the Bible and read it. Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye. Ye means plural. The is singular. The T on the V is singular. Ye means plural, people. So are ye, the nation of Israel, in my, land, in my hand, O house of Israel. So God formed Israel. This is not a spiritual uh, before the world began or even in their wombs. God created the nation. We saw that before. He miraculously conceived in Sarah, uh, in Rebekah, and uh, Rachel, right? We've seen him bring them out miraculously out of Egypt. God formed the nation. Exodus 4.22, he says, they're my firstborn son. That's what he calls the nation. God formed them. There's no other nation God formed except for Israel. Okay? So Jeremiah 18, verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? So what's the question here? At what point, at what instant, right, at what point shall I speak regarding the nation, the nation that he formed here, to concerning a kingdom, the kingdom God promised Israel, to pluck them up, to pull them down, to destroy it? At what point will I destroy the people that I created? Just like the potter has something here, and he's I'm going to destroy it, make a new one. At what point will God destroy his vessel? How long will we wait? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn, uh, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. You see that? So the reason why he's going to destroy it is if they do evil. If they don't do evil, if they turn from the evil, they repent of the evil, I will repent of what I was going to do to them. Okay? So here, unlike real clay... The people here can actually fix the mar, right? He's looking at his creation, the nation, and going, they're doing evil, right? Him being the potter, saying, I'm going to destroy these people, right? Now, he says right here, if they repent of the evil, then I will repent of the evil, right? That I won't destroy them, right? They have a choice. At what point will I destroy the clay? If they are disobedient, if they're unfaithful, if they don't do good to me, right? Look at verse 9. Or, yeah, verse 9. At what instant, what point, shall I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? So here's a nation he formed. He promised them a kingdom. At what point will I say, I'm going to build you up. And I'm going to give you the kingdom. And I'm going to plant you and establish you. If it do evil in my sight that I obey not by voice, then I will repent of the good. Wherefore, I, I said I would benefit them. And so again, here we see it's by works. Right? His decision to plant it or destroy it is dependent on if they do evil or not. If they're faithful to him or not. If they get into his purpose. You know why? Because he's the potter. He can make another clay just like you. Not you individually. The nation. Right? He's promised that a nation would be over the other nations. He didn't promise that Joe Bob and Suzanne in Israel would go there. He promised the nation would go there. So if you're doing evil, I'm going to wipe you out and make another one. You see? exactly what happens in Jesus' earthly ministry. He comes to his own, his own receive him not. He turns to those that actually bear fruit and says, I'm giving it to you. Right? I'm giving it to you, righteous Israel. Okay. So now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Okay. So the appeal here. That they need to do right. In verse 12, they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. So how does the evil respond? We're not listening to you, God. Right? So what's going to happen to that vessel? It's going to be smashed. All right? That's Jeremiah 18, 1 through 12. Let's turn back to Romans 9 and see if we can get some understanding here about these vessels. I did all of that studying Isaiah about the potter and the clay and the relation between God and Israel and the covenant. So when we read Romans 9, hopefully you have some, uh, something to base your interpretation on instead of just popular opinion that every one of you individually is the clay that God's forming right now. Okay, Romans 9, verse 21. Had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, another unto dishonor? Who's the potter? God. Who's the clay? Israel. How many vessels are there in this verse? Two. How many people are on the planet? Billions. 
Shouldn't there be lots of vessels? There's only two vessels here, folks. A vessel unto honor and a vessel unto dishonor. Now, are you in the vessel of honor or the vessel of dishonor? Well, another question should arise at this point. How do I know? <laughs> right? We read it in Jeremiah 18. You know by if you're doing the works or not. If you do evil to God, you're in a vessel of dishonor. You get destroyed. If you do right, then you're in the vessel of honor. Right? This is what Paul is saying here. And who, who decides what's honorable and what's not? God does. He's the one that says, this is the honorable thing. This is the law. This is the commandment. They can't decide what that is. God does. That's what Romans 9 is dealing with here. Okay? So, we see two vessels from the same lump, by the way. The question is, can the potter, uh, uh, who has power over the clay, of the same lump to make one vessel to honor another dishonor? So, he's talking about Israel, and you've got the same lump, Israel. Right? And of the same lump, he splits it in two, and makes one vessel unto honor. So you got a vessel here. He makes unto honor. And one vessel unto dishonor of the same lump. And the lump is what? Israel. You've got honorable, obedient, faithful Israel. You've got disobedient, unfaithful, ungrateful Israel. These people get wrath. These people get mercy. You see what he's saying here, what he's teaching? He's talking about what happened to Israel here. Let's look at verse 22. Talking about the vessels, talking about the potter, talking about the clay, talking about God's purpose for Israel. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Okay, so we've defined who the two vessels are of the same lump. Now he's talking about uh, vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. Right? We saw wrath and mercy back before with Pharaoh and Moses. Remember that? And we learned how you know, God has mercy to whom he wants. He gets wrath to whom he wants. And based on the two vessels, where does his wrath go? Which, one, which vessel did he smash? The dishonorable one. They get wrath, right? And which one does he give mercy? Which one does he build up in the kingdom? Well, over here, the vessel of mercy. So even though it's God, God's prerogative of who gives mercy to whom he wants, he tells you how he's going to give you mercy. It's by this. The honorable act, the, the doing what God says to do, right? Wrath comes when you disobey his commandments, according to Israel's program here. So he has the power to make it the same lump. Two vessels, what if God willing to show his wrath and make his power known? By the way, the question is, I, I erased the chart. The question is, what happened to Israel, right? Jesus came to Israel. They killed him on the cross, and yet, for all intents and purposes, nothing happened to Israel, Right? So here's Paul, here's Jesus, here's the disciples, the remnant, going, you crucified the Holy One. And there's people standing around going, that's true, why doesn't he strike us dead? If he's true, where's his wrath? If that's true, why didn't he come and conquer the Roman army? Right? Well, it's the man of faith speaking here. He says it's going to come. But the man of doubt was like, well, where's that coming? Right? Apparently God's pleased with us. We're the ones sitting in the temple. You're the one running for your life. You ever heard people talk like that? You have bad circumstances happen to you because God's not blessing you, right? Well, that's what Israel could say 8,000 years ago when they killed the Messiah. There's a small little group who's proclaiming he was the Son of God. And the rest is going, how do you know that? I mean, where's the wrath? If you're preaching wrath to come, where is it? Okay. Peter, as, as far as the end of Peter's life, Peter said there are those who are skeptics about the wrath to come, right? Second Peter, let's look at 2 Peter 3 here. We'll get this a little bit later as well, but Second Peter 3. Peter writes about the scoffers in the last days. Remember that? Second Peter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. There is no wrath. We're still here. The temple's still here. We're still ministering the priesthood. Right? For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens of old, and the earth standing out of the water and the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Talking about the flood, right? So th this hit the same thing in Noah's day. Noah said the flood's going to happen, judgment's coming. They said, no, it's not. It did. Right? They did. They did. And so it's the same thing in Romans 9. What happened to Israel? Wrath didn't come. Okay? Paul's saying they're vessels of dishonor, vessels of wrath, because they, they didn't accept the Messiah. But where's that wrath? What if God, willing to show his wrath, he's not scared to put out his judgment, willing to show his wrath, 
and to make his power known, the power that I'm God and you killed my Messiah, so wham, there you are. Okay. Endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Who are the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Those who rejected the Messiah. Okay. Why was he long suffering? Why? Why didn't he come back at Pentecost and just wham, wipe out the ones that didn't believe? Instead, Peter's there preaching, right? Why? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Oh, that's what Paul's talking about. Not willing that any should perish. Oh, so God's merciful. God's merciful. Not only to those vessels of dishonor, but to these people, so they can preach and get people saved. Wow. The mercy of God. Praise the Lord for that. Right? But of course, sinners, those who reject God, will take that as an opportunity to sin even more. You know. But Romans 9 says, What if God, willing to show his wrath, make his power known, endure with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction. How, are, how do they get fit for destruction? They do evil works. Jeremiah 18. They didn't get fitted for destruction before the world began in the womb of their mamas, where God says, You're going to do evil. I know exactly the guys you're going to kill. That's not what happened. Okay, they were fitted to destruction when they marred themselves by sin. When they did evil works, they didn't get into God's purpose. You know, God can make things right. He can forgive. He can give mercy. He can put you in his purpose. But you have to live by faith. Right? You have to have that faith in God's instructions. So here, he endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Uh, and that he might make known the riches of his glory uh, on the vessels of mercy, which he had a forbear and a glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, also of the Gentiles. Who? The first time that word Gentile shows up here. We need to know what more he's talking about. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. What was God's purpose for Israel? We're dealing with that in Romans 9. God's purpose for Israel was that they would be a mighty nation. They would inhabit a land whereby they would be a blessing to the nations. Right? God first for Israel included the Gentiles. It always did. How did it include them? Because Israel would be the blessing to those Gentiles. You see? That was God's purpose for the earth. The kingdom of Israel would sit on a mountain and all the Gentile nations would come to them and get blessing and forgiveness and the law and everything else. God's purpose for Israel, God's purpose for the earth, always included the Gentiles. Gentiles subservient to Israel. Gentiles below Israel. There was a difference, but they were there. Okay? Romans chapter 2. If you remember back in Romans 2, Paul is dealing with why Israel has no excuse. We've also been dealing with tonight a little bit. In Romans 2, <clears throat> verse, verse 2, we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Sin. So Romans 9, that applies as well. What God does is true no matter what you think about it. Verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you think just because you're Israel, whom God promised to be above the Gentiles, talking to these dishonorable ones, do you think you will escape the judgment of God because you're Israel? Because they could make the claim, I'm Israel, right? Gentiles deserve wrath, not me. But only if you're honorable, only if you're in this vessel, and only if you're faithful, Romans 2, verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Change your mind. Why does God put up with Israel all the time in, in times past? So that these guys would get into this vessel. Right? So they'd be faithful. So all of Israel would follow the Lord's instruction. But that's not been the case. Okay. Verse 5, After thy hardness and impenitent heart, hardness, have we covered in that Romans 9? Why are they hard? Because they're resisting God. You know, when God has a purpose, he doesn't change it. Here's God's purpose. He says, this is what I'm going to do. And when you say, I don't want to do that, you're contrary to him. You're resisting him. Okay? God doesn't change his purpose. Okay? He's standing there. So the more you resist, the harder you're going to become because God's harder than you are in his position. That's how that works. And so in their hardness and impenitent heart, they treasure up into thyself wrath against the day of wrath in revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So here they are, vessels of dishonor, resisting God, and they're just making that vessel bigger. More wrath, more wrath. It's going to come. It's going to be poured out. Right? 
In verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, what do they get? Eternal life. But unto them that are what? Contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, and indignation, and wrath. So how do you get to be the vessel of wrath? According to Romans 2 in Israel's program, disobedient. disobedient. How do you get to be the vessel that gets eternal life? Well, according to here, you're patient continuance and well-doing. Right? But if you're not in well-doing, if you're not patient, like Jesus said, and your patience possesses your souls, then you're not going to get it. If you don't endure to the end, you won't be saved. Mark 13, 13. It's Israel's program. So verse 9 says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Every soul. Not just those pagan Gentiles that we talk about in Romans 1. But also Israel, who doesn't do right. Romans 2, verse, you see it there in verse 9? Every soul of the Jew first and also the Gentile. Why is it the Jew first? Because here's God up here. He's the potter, remember? He formed the nation. His wrath comes down. Who hits it first? These people. Right? You can't give blessings to these people until these people are pure. So he's poured out the wrath. Jew first, then the Gentiles. You see? That's why it's Jew first. Because they're God's people in Romans 2. Paul's talking about the difference between the vessels of wrath and the vessels of honor amongst the nation of Israel. In verse uh, 10, Romans 2, verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first, and also the Gentile. Who gets the riches of God's glory first in God's program for Israel? Israel. Jew first, and then the Gentiles. It flows through to the Gentiles. By the way, the faithful Gentiles, right? Not all of them. So we have two Israels, we also have two Gentiles, right? We have the disobedient who get God's wrath, the obedient to God's purpose for Israel who get the mercy and grace. This is going to be important for next week because we'll see that who gets God's blessing? These Gentiles and these Israelites. Who doesn't get it? These Gentiles, these Israelites. So can we say that the Gentiles get it before Israel? Yeah, we can. Whoa, blows your mind, doesn't it? That in God's purpose for Israel, how can these Gentiles get it? Because they were faithful to God's purpose. The, and Israel over here, the dishonorable Israelites were not. Okay, they're the potter's clay. They're crushed. So we see back in Romans 2, those fitted for destruction, those fitted for glory, for mercy, because of the deeds in Romans 2. And, it, and Romans 2 is dealing with Israel's program. <coughs> you, by the way, are not judged by that in this dispensation. Right? God has revealed the dispensation of his grace, whereby he's not imputing sins to the world. He's presenting reconciliation. And today he's looking at you and offering grace, whereby when you are a sinner, God committed his love toward you, that he died for you. You put your faith in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in the gospel, your faith in the gospel, which means you're not resisting God's will. That he gives you by his grace all things freely. It's not according to your works. right? But they didn't know about the cross in Romans 2, meaning in Israel's program. They didn't know about the cross in time past. They didn't know about the cross in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is what Paul's dealing with in Romans 9 through 11, right? What happened to Israel? They stumbled, right? They failed to get that which God promised to them because they were disobedient. They rejected God's purpose. That's what the explanation is. Let's go back to uh, Romans 9 here. Romans chapter 9. What if God, willing to show his wrath, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared? You know what was not afore prepared since the world began? The body of Christ, the church. Okay? You know what was afore prepared since the world began? God's purpose for Israel and for the earth. That's what was. Acts chapter 3, verse 21, Peter says, since the world began, he's been speaking about the restoration of the whole planet through his chosen people Israel, then to the Gentiles, right? Well, that's what's been prepared since the world began. The church has not been being prepared. It was kept secret. It was in the mind of God before the world began, and suddenly, blam, he reveals it to Paul. Uh, where's the preparation? <laughs> okay. So here, some of those vessels of, of mercy afore prepared we're at Romans chapter 9. For prepared unto glory. Romans chapter 2, those who get glory are those that are obedient. By the way, we find glory in Romans 9 verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption and the glory? Well, who gets those glory? Who gets God's promises to Israel? The vessels of mercy. Right here. Obedient, faithful Israel. 
That's who gets it. Not this Israel over here that's chasing Peter's group, that's killing Peter's group, that crucified the Messiah, that didn't repent at Pentecost. Not those guys. Right? Not even the Jerusalem. Take yourself back into Peter's time, years, or Paul's time 2,000 years ago. Not the Jerusalem that then was. They don't get it. Why? Because the Jerusalem that then was rejected the Messiah. Okay? So can we on any level say that the Jerusalem that now is who rejects the Messiah gets God's promises? No. You see the lesson we're learning here? John Hagee is wrong. Just because they're Jews and just because they're in Jerusalem does not mean they get God's promises. That applies to today, 2013. People don't make the connection. They think they see God's people in the Bible, they must be the same people. No. There's two Israels. Okay. Which vessel are they in? That's the question. How do they handle Jesus Christ? That's the question. And so, the vessels of mercy are those that receive the Messiah. John 1, 11, verse 12. We'll quote it again. Christ came to his own his own nation, his own received him not. But to those that received him, he gave power to become the sons of God. That teaches that there's two Israels. God came to the whole nation, and he split them up. Jesus said in Luke 12, I came to bring division, a sword, to separate the faithful from the unfaithful. Right? And so that's what happened in Luke chapter 2, 32, where Zechariah prophesies about the Messiah, about Jesus, and says he came to fulfill the promises made to the fathers to bring the glory that was promised. But he didn't give that glory to these, the unfaithful nation over here. Okay. Yeah. Romans 9, 24. We'll wrap up with this last verse here. We need to cover something. Yeah. Where Paul says, The vessels of mercy yeah. who hath, he had before prepared in the glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Question, how did he call them? This is, go, this is what we're going to see in Romans chapter 10. How did God call these people? Okay. Where did Israel fail? When what Paul's not dealing with. They failed many times in history. But what happened to Israel's promises from where Paul's standing? It was in Jesus' earthly ministry, right? Something happened. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Acts. Something happened there where all of a sudden God's promises went somewhere else. Right? Who is it? The church? The remnant? Here it says the vessels of mercy. Whom he hath called. How did he call them? Jesus was calling them to the kingdom. He said the kingdom is at hand. He says, I am the Messiah. Believe on me as the Son of God. Isn't that what he was calling them to do? He did not at one time in his earthly ministry call on them to trust in his death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. Never once. Okay? You won't find it. The first time you find that message is when Jesus Christ came back and revealed it to Paul. And that's the foundation of, the, of preaching of the cross, which is the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ. Okay? But here he says, to whom, whom he hath called. Who did he call? Abraham or Lot? Who did he call? Ishmael or Isaac? Whom did he call? Jacob or Esau? Who did he call? <coughs> All of Israel or faithful Israel? Right? Who, who answered the call? And so, whom he called, not of Israel only, it says, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. That's always been the case. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Uh, Through Israel, all the nations would be blessed. Okay? It, it, you find some examples in your outline there of Gentiles being blessed, even though Israel was rejecting him. Luke 7, 5 through 9. Let's read just one of them here. We read one on Sunday as well. Where Jesus came to his own, and his own people rejected him. But in Luke 7, you see an example of a Gentile centurion who loved the nation of Israel and built a synagogue of the nation of Israel and blessed Israel according to what God said Gentiles should do. And in Luke 7, verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them and turned him about and said unto the people, that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Wow. So he sees faithful Gentiles, but not faithful Israel. That's what happened. He sees some faithful Israel, 12 disciples, right? And some of those folks. But not all of them. That's what's happened in Luke 7. Matthew 8, 10, and 12 is the same thing. We, in Matthew 15, Matthew 15, the Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman, comes to Jesus pleading for him to give them a, a, a miracle because she knows he's the son of God. She's a Gentile. He didn't even come to her. He says, I didn't come to you. I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. Right? But wow, you found faith among Gentiles and not among his own people. What happened to Israel? They rejected Jesus. They stumbled at him. Okay, they didn't receive it by faith. But who did receive it by faith? The Canaanite woman, the centurion, Cornelius, Acts 10, a devout man blessing the nation of Israel. And Peter was sent to him, and he spoke in tongues. Right? A Gentile. Right? 
So who gets the blessings now? Faithful Israel, faithful Gentiles. Not of the Jews only, also of the Gentiles. You're not seeing here instruction about the church. There's no Jew or Gentile in the church, folks. Okay? You're the new creature. You're a body of Christ. You're neither Jew nor Gentile. And you don't get blessed through Israel. The church, if I may draw it up here, is an entirely different animal. Here's God right here, right? Over Israel. God, can I say God and Jesus Christ, who is the king of Israel and who will reign over the earth? Here's the church. Not made up of Jew or Gentile. Here's the world down here. The world gets God's wrath. You get God's grace by going through Jesus Christ directly. He's your head. You're the members of his body. You don't have to go through Israel. You don't need their covenants. You're not under some sort of clay principle. Okay? You are dead in Christ, and you're resurrected in Christ. You're a member of his body. There's no fear of being clay with God. There's no fear of him crushing the clay under his foot. You're in his body. You're just waiting for him to pull you up to heaven. See, that's the different relationship here. Now, the rest of the world, Jew and Gentile, whomever you are, they don't believe the gospel. They're not going to be part of the body, you see. There's a different relationship today in the dispensation of grace than there is with Israel, God's chosen nation, and the other nations. Here, there's individual salvation that determines whether you're in God's purpose or not. Here, it's people being faithful to God's purpose for the nation of Israel. Okay? So there's a difference in God's dealing for the earth and God's dealing right now with his ambassadors who are foreign representatives on the earth. All right? So this, in Romans 9, 24, this is the first time Gentiles are mentioned in Romans 9. Every verse so far has been about Israel. The first time you can even claim that it's not is in this verse when it mentions the word Gentiles. But we've seen these are the Gentiles that are blessing Israel. Being God's blessing, not the church. Okay? And so this is the first time he's mentioning it. Uh, what Paul is saying about Israel, what he's saying happened to them is that God showed long-suffering uh, and, and, and continued ministering to them even after they crucified him so that he can bring glory upon those that did believe him. Okay, He didn't strike Israel down when he died on that cross. It was when, he, when he resurrected, he sent down the Holy Ghost and gave power to the riches of glory to the remnant of Israel at Pentecost so they can minister. They go on the kingdom. Okay. God has a purpose. He'll get it done despite how many people reject it. All right, but he'll get it done through those vessels of mercy, the people who are obedient to his will. Okay, We'll pick up in Romans 9.25 where people really drop the ball thinking that uh, a prophet of Israel is talking about the church. And we'll deal with what he's talking about in Hosea next week. Okay, Any questions? Any thoughts? Good stuff. Yes, sir. What about the... Uh... Well, the, the, yeah. Well, you, you saw what I was doing here. I was keeping the context in the context Paul's dealing with, right. which is Israel. So you have vessels here. You have prophecies about the vessels. And it has to do with Israel. Second Timothy two twenty. I'm glad you brought that up. That used to be on my outline, but I didn't want to go two hours. Now I will. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know you want to be here. Um, the prosecutor brought it up. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter two, verse nineteen. By the way, this is right after Paul says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Why does he say that? Because there's people teaching different doctrines. You need to know what God's doing, right? And so in verse 18, there are those teaching a wrong doctrine of the resurrection, overthrowing the faith of some. You need to know what God is doing and when. Uh, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. So he gave a promise to the nation of Israel, but he knows in the nation which ones are his, right? He knows the faithful from the unfaithful. And he's talking here also about us, talking to Timothy. God knows which one of us are his and which are not, which ones of us are fooling him and not. It's by faith, after all. He's the one that determines this. And so he knows those are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So he's dealing here with how we behave. Earlier he dealt with uh, not, strife, not striving against others about uh, silly doctrines and things. And here he says... Uh, if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. And so in verse 20, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. And so the vessel of honor here is the person that purges himself from what? Iniquity. Verse 19. Okay. Now Christ already paid for your sins. Right? He, he, your sins have no dominion over you. 
But in order to be a vessel used of God, that's what he says, prepared unto the good work, meet for the master's use. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about God being able to use you, right? Then you've got to purge iniquity from yourself. Because you could be saved by grace, walk around, go, you know, I'm not under the law. God saved me by his grace, paid for my sins, and you don't do any good works, right? That's not what you should do. Ephesians 2.10 says we're ordained unto good works. We should do them, right? So here you need to purge yourself from iniquity. You need to do the things that is fitting of being named of Christ. You're named of Christ first in this case. Back here, you're not in the vessel until after he analyzes what you did. In the church, you, by faith, you're in Christ. And now he says you're in Christ, you need to act like it. You see, that's what's going on here. And so the vessel here is someone who purges iniquity from himself. But notice, what happens if he doesn't purge the iniquity from himself? Okay. He says in verse 20, there are some vessels in the great house of gold and silver and wood and earth. So there are honorable and dishonorable vessels here, but he's not saying uh, the person here who was at one time a dishonorable vessel can purge himself of iniquity and become an honorable vessel. Right? So it's not the Calvinist idea that God has chosen you to be a vessel of wrath, no change in it. Right? And you to be a vessel of honor, no change in it. No, instead, we have here an instruction to make yourself a vessel of honor, right? Don't be a vessel of dishonor. Okay, so yeah, we, we have a, a similar uh, language here, um, but again, it has to do with people being able to decide what vessel they are based on their response to what God's purpose is for them, right? God's purpose for us is that we put our faith in the gospel of Christ, not of works, <laughs> and Ephesians 2.10, after it says you're saved by grace, not of works, you are ordained to good works, right? So God's purpose for you Put your faith in the gospel and do good works, right? Not the other way around. Do good works, but it's, it's the gospel first, right? So does that, does that answer a little bit? Yeah. yeah, so we shouldn't be afraid of similar terminology. In fact, Paul uses a lot of similar ter terminology, but we need to ask, you know, who's he speaking to and what's the purpose here you know, that God's doing because it does change, you know, so. All right, any other thoughts? It was very different in Jeremiah 18 where because of the evil they did, they were vessels of wrath, and God crushed them. You don't see that in 2 Timothy 2. It's just a preparation. All right, let's say a prayer. 